Very good question. What happened was, um, so the question is if you haven't heard, why was Hingoli chosen? We'll come to you in a minute. Uh, why was Hingoli chosen? And that is uh, because uh, we did, uh, first of all, there were all these restrictions put on the detection of gravitational waves. It has to be seismically quiet and it has to be at least 15 kilometers from any railway line, hard to find in India. It has to be at least, you know, uh, 50 kilometers from a nearest city, but not more than 100 kilometers because you need an airport and stuff like that. So all these constraints were given. So we actually, there were a couple of undergraduates who did this in Aisar Kolkata, not Aisar Pune, did this whole project in which they wrote little Python scripts to look at maps given to us from Cartosat in ISRO because we couldn't get the highest resolution Google Maps. So we got the Cartosat maps, which are one meter resolution, and we actually wrote a script that went through the Indian map with these restrictions, found 25 places. And so in 25 of these places from Rajasthan, in Madhya Pradesh, in, in Maharashtra, we found places that are not near railway line. Then we went to the Indian Railways plans of the next 25 years and found that the Madhya Pradesh site, which looked wonderful, actually has a railway line going from Kota to Bhopal, passing just near it. And it'll have these marbles going, that, that, you know, we can't do that. So all that we did. And then we put seismometers at all these places. And Hingoli won. It's actually seismically 10 times quieter than anywhere in the US. So it's, Deccan Plateau is an amazing place. It's very, very stable. Yeah, that's true. But earthquakes are different. Earthquakes are, are, uh, are not regular events. If an earthquake happens, we'll deal with it. Act of God. But you're right. I mean, the, my first reaction was also that. Are Latur is just there. But you look at a time average because in, in the nearest uh, city is Nanded. And Nanded University has a wonderful uh, geology department that has kept seismic records over the last 30 years. It's absolutely amazingly quiet place. In particularly in the frequencies we are looking at, which is a, a, a 1 hertz to 100 hertz. And it's absolutely fantastic. But you know, if you have an earthquake, we'll have to deal with it. But that can happen anyway. Sorry, I can come to you just a moment. Yes. Yeah. So first of all, uh, thanks a lot for a most fascinating lecture I've heard for a long, long time. <laughs> and while you were talking, I was wishing that at least one of my professors or teachers was like you. My whole life would have changed. So that's <laughs> another flaw I said. I mean, all the researchers are not kept in universities okay, or schools, so right? My, yeah. So coming to my question. Uh, you mentioned that you know India has 10% of this, you know, of the 30 meter telescope, 6% of that, and so on and so forth. How does that happen? Is there a coordinating agency, or, or do they put out tenders saying that you know which country and countries bid for it? How does that? Very work? interesting. So this science doesn't work that way. But and what happens is, yeah, it's a, yeah, that yeah. So you can cover both. When we say we have 10% stake, 6% stake. How will it translate in value for the country or the industry? Yeah. I'll come to both. So Very good. Cost of the project, is yeah. that what it means? Yeah. 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 Cost translates into the stake you have. So I'll tell you what the stake means in a moment. But um, for example, LIGO India is 100% India because we are just building it. Um, but um, yeah, OK. So how does it work? It works LIGO. How did it happen? Look at the history. It, it's, these are not systematic things that tenders are put out. LIGO India, well, LIGO built three detectors and three systems. The entire system, three of them were built. Two of them were supposed to be in Washington State and one in Louisiana. And then the NSF decided to fund only two of them. So they had the third system and they didn't know what to do with it. So if you go to Hanford, you'll see two tunnels there. And one tunnel is empty. And the mirrors and the lasers and all the electronics is all boxed up. So then they said, we built this. We want this to work. We also recognize the gravitational wave detector is like a microphone. It has no directionality. So the best way to find where the thing came from is to do a triangulation 
with a third. So let us get it as far away from the US as possible. What is as far away from the US as possible? Australia. So they first went to Australia. Australia sat on it for two years saying that we will do it, we will put it in the Australian desert, nobody lives there, no trains, nothing. But they did not have the money because they had, they were investing in the SKA, in, the, in astronomy that is. So when they decided to go for the square kilometer array in radio astronomy, they spent all their money. So then it was up for grabs and they were going around, China, China, China said, okay, we, we will want it, we will build it here, but you will have to come and build it for us, we are not going to do it, we will give you money. The Americans said, look, it is a collaboration between Caltech and MIT, we do not have people. We cannot actually sit in China for 10 years. And we don't even want to do it because it's for you, right? It's for your country. So then it came to India because India has a community. I didn't tell you that a Nobel Prize winning paper of the thousand authors of that paper, 40 were from India, right? 10 of them from my institution, right? So India has had a gravitational wave community for a long time. And uh, so they said, okay, we can do it, but we are all theorists. So how can we do it? And then we approached the government. I wasn't there then. I just came into the system now. They approached the government and the DAE, the Department of Atomic Energy and DST, then said, okay, they wrote a, a proposal together for the cabinet saying we'll pull together half from each. So the cabinet note says 1,300 crores, half DST, half DAE, DAE leads it. And the DAE, the, the three labs that I said, Raja Ramana and IPR, they are DAE labs. They said, okay, we'll build it. But we don't have manpower, so we need Ayuka to actually do the science with us. Ayuka doesn't belong to DAE or DST, we belong to the MHRD. So, so we, we tag along, we don't pay anything, but we actually provide our services. That's how it came. And then it got stuck in the government because that was when the government was changing. And so you're not allowed to allocate money like a thousand crores just before the elections. Then the new government came and they didn't do anything for a long time because no big decisions were taken in this current government for the first two years about allocation of funds to science. Then the detection happened. It so happened that I became the director of Ayuka 14 days before that. In fact, 28 days after I became director, AstroSat was launched. It changed my life completely. These big things happened. So people come, came and said, this is stuck in the government. What do you do? So I said, okay, I'll go to the prime minister. So we went through various channels, went all the way up to the prime minister. I actually personally met the prime minister. Of course. Before that, you had to go through all this and all the advisors around the prime minister, before that the PMO, before that the chief advisor, scientific advisor, all of them we had to approach first. So Archidambaram, who was then the scientific advisor, already knew about LIGO, he's very excited, and then went all the way up and we said, look, we know that, so I asked LIGO for permission to divulge the information to our prime minister because this was under embargo for six months. And during that period, we started saying, look, if India announces that they're going to build the third one, which will be able to pinpoint these things, imagine the prime minister tweeting this <laughs> exactly when it is being announced. So I, I first want, I, I went to the prime minister saying, why don't you announce this on the 1st of January at the Science Congress before the announcement comes, as if India is doing something prescient. That did not happen, the, the time scales did not, did not work out. But in the end, the government listened. And it so happened that the announcement was made, we had a press conference in Ayuka, uh, which we, we live streamed the announcement from Washington DC, which was at 10 o'clock there, it was 9 o'clock in the night here. Within 10 minutes, the five tweets from the prime minister saying, we are going to build the third detector. So all that was engineered very carefully. But it, it so happened that the government committed to it. But a lot of the other things we were talking about were committed like that. So for example, the 30 meter telescope. So Caltech and the University of California started the project. They went out looking for partners. China said they'll commit 10 percent, 10 percent of the money. Uh, Japan said 21 percent of the money. Canada said 20 percent of the money. And then it came to India. India was considering offers at that time, this was 10 years ago, from other rival telescopes. Europe is building another one in Chile. And so they were considering the same, how to do it. But India had already made the decision of getting into big science. So that was a DST-led project. But half DST, half DAE again comes out of both budgets. Now, 
then the, gov the government committee that looked at this turned around and said, we can only commit this kind of money if the money is spent in India. We are going to give 10 percent cash. That came, went up to 20 percent cash. So, 80 percent of that money is being spent in India, Indian industry. That is the, the, the so who does it go to? 10 percent of the whole, so we are getting credit for the work that is being done here as contribution, it's in kind contribution, right? So, we have to show, for example, we polish these mirrors, that is a certain part of that contribution. We're writing the entire software that gets, gets us this million amount of millions of dollars of contribution. And so, we are benefiting from it. ITER, I told you, the 25,000 crores, whatever. The main company, Indian company that's building the stuff is, is Lassen and Tubro. They have they employ hundreds of people in southern France where this is being built, right? And so, and, and there, that's just one company I just named. There are many other companies. So this is, it benefits Indian industry directly, even in the building project. And of course, India gets the scientific output out of it. And the, the percentage that I'm talking about benefits us in percentage of time as well. So when the TMT is built, 10% of the nights in the year will come to Indian scientists, right? So that's the idea. I hope so. I hope so. Because this, at a level, actually, the, the level at which these decisions are taken actually has, it, well, of course, it, the, 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 the agreement comes from the very top. It's the cabinet and the PM that decides in the end. But the infrastructure is very robust. It, it, it's, uh, it's the decisions taken by scientists who are advising the government. And I, government, and I, I can, I had direct, you know, experience of this, talking to, going up this line, talking to the people who are involved. The people who are the secretaries of the various uh, uh, departments, the people who are the advisory committees of the various departments, now the principal scientific advisor is a different person who is also absolutely fantastic. They have very deep understanding of this science, so they can pick out what projects, and these are just the physics projects I'm talking about. A lot of the bureaucrats have very deep knowledge of science, and I was amazed going through this whole process when I talked to the bureaucrats who are involved in advising the ministry and stuff like that what interest they had and what kind of understanding they had. That, that's a very interesting thing. Like, you know, in the software world, uh, there's been a long uh, <coughs> movement of open source. And uh, now it's matured to such an extent that even the underlying hardware technologies, like in a computer you have this uh, central right. processing that's unit, it. the bus, the memory, yeah. you, uh, which were, uh, you know, distinct companies and distinct niches uh, in themselves and they never uh, revealed uh, their uh, you know internals to the rest of the uh, industry so uh, that was typically closed but uh, now that uh, you know uh, computational power uh, hit uh, different kinds of walls uh, even the hardware industry has kind of opened up because that's the only way innovation will happen. Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to kind of uh, see if there's a chance for transferring this yeah, wisdom. Very, very understand what you're saying. So it's actually very, very crucial. I, IPR is a big issue. And uh, here, see, in the scientific world, we've al always worked, I mean, particularly in projects like this, we've always worked with open data. Because even, for example, NASA builds a satellite. AstroSat is built by ISRO. We have a proprietary period for about a year or two years, after which you have to make everything public, because eventually the money is coming from the public, right? And so NASA, for example, has these amazing archives, and you know, you, anybody can go into the NASA archives, you can do that, download their data, anything that's more than a year old, from the Hubble Space Telescope, from any telescope that's in space, stuff like that. This is always done. In CERN, the same thing happens after a proprietary period, which goes to the people who built the instruments it becomes public. LIGO, that's happening already. The first cycle, everything is public now. And just that period, we give them the chance of the people who build the thing to get the science out of it. And then anybody else can milk the science. And the same thing happens in hardware. The interesting thing is, this is why we are, we are doing this kind of um, confrontation with the technology world. And we'll have series of these meetings between industry and us. If there's a huge, huge, huge scope of this technology being spun off, interested. Think of this. I mean, you're building something that's detecting 10 to the power minus 18 meters. How many 
industries use very precise measurements. Think of the amount of development that has gone in in isolating vibration. Think of the industry. That, so I will give you an example. My colleagues in Glasgow who built the entire suspension system for LIGO, the vibration isolation, they are coming in January for this meeting here because it is an Indo-UK thing that we are doing. Glasgow built the vibration system for both the mostly the American system, but a little bit for the European system as well. They have spun off into a company that produces a vibration isolation system for uh, surgeons who do uh, eye surgery, right. Think of how amazing this is. They, they can, you know, get rid of vibrations at the level of 10 to 18. This is nothing. <laughs> so, uh, so that is just an example. There is so much. Uh, I mean, uh, LIGO, if you go to the LIGO website, you will get examples of industries that have been spun off, startups that have been spun off from the discoveries that they have been made. Some of them are proprietary because MIT and Caltech did the research and they spun off into companies. Um, now, many of them might not be open source because they are spun off into technology that has been further researched. But what has come up from NSF funding and what will come from Indian government funding? A lot of that has to be in the public domain in the end. And that these things are worked out, what, what is spun off technology and what is proprietary, stuff like that. And the kind of software we are writing for these things, yeah, it eventually is being, it's coming from public funding. And so it is, it is, it goes into the public domain. All this data and software goes into the public domain. But sir, what about the corollary? As in, now you are talking about the data and the technology that you are using which would be a public domain. But you must have mapped out certain uh, uh, certain uh, uh, raw material that you would be using in building LIGO. And some R&D might be going in that industry as well. And now you have mapped out a period of 10 years. So what if a breakthrough comes up in that industry? So would you be in a position to incorporate that? I, I think, I think you are right. Very good point. And uh, that has happened even in the previous technology that has happened. But the way, I mean, if a breakthrough happens in a university or um, in an institution that is funded by public money, then the intellectual property rights is normally governed by the rules of the government and public, not in the private industry. And so, for example, this thing I told you about is a major, major discovery, which was how to actually build a cavity in which you have the laser bounce back and forth and thus multiply this effect. This was Ron Draver who did this again in Edinburgh. And he would have got the Nobel Prize had he not died just for a few months before the Nobel Prize. So this is used everywhere in, in all laser labs now. And it's in public domain because you, you, you write papers about it. And so you, in the papers, you, you give all details of, of, and people can just reproduce it. So major pieces of technology can be done. But if you have employed a certain company to develop something and they have their own IPR, so the MOU actually has that written into it that they will use that utilize that, that intellectual property right to their advantage. And that can happen if we, if there is a company that wants to protect their intellectual property rights. These MOUs are tricky and they have not happened very extensively. A lot of this, because it is led by government monies in the public domain. I will give an example of, of a technology that was developed for LIGO that I do not know who is going to do that for LIGO India. Those steel tubes, 4 kilometers long, now you might think that we built oil pipelines, thousands of kilometers, no problem. These have to hold 10 to minus minus 9 tor, so these cannot be oil pipelines. So if you look at how these were done, these were steel segments, and of course the steel itself was produced directly for this, from, from industry for this, but with specifications that went from the academics, so the steel industry does not own the property rights. And then these came in segments and they were spiral welded, okay spiral welded by two people. This was done in the 80s, 90s, two people operating exactly at the same speed <laughs> on both sides of the surface, right? Otherwise, if there is a mismatch, you will have cavities through which uh, air can escape and stuff like that. Now, this was done by a company in Chicago that does not exist anymore, and I do not know who I am going to get in India to do this. But these things we will have to, there is very specialist tasks. Now, if, for example, I'm stuck with a company that has such a specialist task that only they can do, 
then of course they will have, they will own the property rights if they develop something. Now I, I, I think this has to be done automatically, you can computerize this, right. In the 90s we couldn't do this. But the fact that if you want to do this kind of spiral end uh, welding, it might not be two humans, but, but two machines doing it. So I, I, you know, this is something, so th all these little bits of things that we'll have to develop, we are looking forward to. And of course, a lot of this research, how to, how to bring down noise in the lasers, and all that stuff is being done. There's something called Newtonian noise. I, I didn't even think about it before coming into this. And that is, as the earth vibrates due to this micro seismic thing stuff, the gravitational force between the earth and this thing that's, that's uh, being suspended, the mirror varies. <laughs> and that is comparable to what you're trying to do. So, the, so now I have IIT Hyderabad doing research on how to minimize this. Now, since it's an IIT, the research that's being done is in the public domain. So what they'll write papers on it. But if I had a company do something as specialized as this. Uh, sir, uh, how to connect with this mission individually, like uh, uh, voluntarily if I want to contribute something here? Very interesting. We don't have a mechanism of it. But of course, we have, we have a presence in the public domain. We have a website. We have our Twitter page. We have our Facebook page. In fact, on our Facebook page, we get lots of people writing saying, how can I get involved? And we try to engage people in, so we're only starting up. So I am, I am on this tour now of go, going to various educational institutions, giving them presentations, saying, I know that you have a group that works on, I don't know, thin film technology. I can use your services because I need to build the films that will go onto the mirrors, right, with very low noise. Can you do this? And stuff like that. We give them talks and individual. So, so we give them talks which are related to their technology. Now, if you have a skill that helps us in this phase of building, then by all means contact us. I put my website, uh, uh, my, my email address there. I can give you my card. And also, you can write to us through social media, etc. And we will try to engage as much as possible. Right now, we are at the level of engaging institutions and their students, a very large number of students from all over India coming to do projects. You know, we have, we're building a joint thing with ICER Pune, for example, to train students in LIGO technology, uh, which will have a presence in both IUCA and ICER and stuff like that. All that is happening. But slowly, we are going to increase the range of skills that we are going to need in, in building this and then running this. And so, of course, we need lots of people. So please contact us. Yes. The significance. Um, well, I, I tried to build up the talk to kind of give you a feel for what the significance is. But let me repeat. The LIGO India is giving us information about the universe in, at, in a domain that we have not probed before. I showed you the entire electromagnetic waves, right? You have x-rays, gamma rays radio, optical, and they give us information about different things in the universe, about things that are 1,000 degrees hot, million degrees hot, 100 degrees hot, etc. But what if no radiation, electromagnetic radiation comes out of something, everything has gravitation, so there's a whole universe out there which we don't see. And everything emits gravitational waves because they're moving, and if they move, they send ripples out in space. And we've only started to find these things now. When we get to a phase, I don't know, 100 year from, years from now, when we detect you know, motion of planets or motion of stars around or, or exploding things, then we start seeing quote unquote universe through their gravity. And that just opens up the whole window. We don't know what to expect. Did we know what the universe was like 300 years ago when the first telescope was used? We didn't even know that we were moving around the sun. So, um, so you can see how much we have to build technology that gets past the bound barriers of knowledge. And of course, you didn't know that astronomy, when Galileo built his telescope, that 300 years from now, astronomers will build the technology that gives you your mobile phone, right? And the camera in your mobile phone. So <clears throat> you can't plan for such things. You have to do work at the boundaries of knowledge, push them. And then the benefits will come. That's the idea.
is the same speed of light, same speed as light. And that was established actually, I did not talk about this, yeah. It, 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 Einstein showed that, no, no, it is not a coincidence. Einstein showed that and that is, it is actually, it is linked with the speed of light because uh, it is the maximum speed possible. Uh, Einstein's theory shows that if you see at what speed it will go, it will be at the speed of light. You remember that in the Einstein's equation itself, the speed of light comes in because it is inbuilt in the whole thing as the thing that is constant, that holds space and time together. Now, this was established last year when we actually pinpointed one of the sources of gravitational waves. It is the only source that has been seen in light. And that happened, I do not, did not talk about it. Um, and that is a, a collision of two neutron stars to form a black hole. That was detected last year. And what, because black holes when they merge, they remain black holes. But when two neutron stars merge, they can cause a enormous explosion that sends out light, x-rays, optical, etc. So even though one could not pinpoint the location, we threw all the telescopes of the world at it. And eventually we detected it in JMRT in Pune. We detected it through um, uh, radio telescopes, optical telescopes, everything. And it was shown that the gamma rays and the x-rays that were emitted arrived at the same time as the gravitational. So for the localization, mm. why do we restrict ourselves to the territorial boundary of uh, the country? We should look at the whole earth. Yeah, we can send one to the moon if we can build it, right? But so whole earth meaning what? Meaning the rest of the LIGOs are say in the northern hemisphere. No, no, that is why they tried to put one in Australia, but they could not because Australia could not afford it. Eventually we will. Right now, it so happens that the northern hemisphere countries can build, have the capacity to build these things. So Japan is building a three kilometer one and Virgo, has, Italy has built a three kilometer one and things like that. But you are right, you get the maximum baselines if you go to the southern hemisphere. Eventually, we will build one in Antarctica, try to build a normal thing there now. You know, it will slowly go there. But yes, absolutely. We'll, and, and as I said, if we can assemble one in the moon, that will be fantastic. In fact, there is a proposal to ISRO that has been recently sent to put a little satellite that, you know, uh, goes around from satellites that we can do it. Eventually, there is something called LISA that was planned by NASA, which got cancelled, which had three satellites, which have lasers bouncing in between them, 3,000, 300,000 kilometers apart to detect gravitational waves, right? Not three kilometers or four kilometers, but 300,000 kilometers. And they would tumble around right and 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 do this now that's got cancelled but now europe has taken it up and they are developing this is will be called elisa now i don't know india might join it but that's a plan for 2035 or something like that but so we can do this we can just increase the baseline on the surface of the earth at a single place it is difficult due to the curvature of the earth but people are already thinking of how to build 10 kilometer long arms by compensating for the curvature of the earth people are thinking about this and on the earth, we have not found a site, a country in the southern hemisphere who will take one up. But there are, I mean, South Africa and Australia both are extremely quiet regions. There are deserts where one can build things like that. Four kilometers, yeah. It is identical to the LIGO US ones. So the three will have very identical technology. I will take one minute to just point out something which will resonate with a lot of people here. You think it's identical technology. They built these things, they sent it over to us, they gave us their blueprints, and we're adapting it to the Indian conditions. But we have to figure out what we have to buy from the Indian market, right? So start with screws. So the vacuum technology is being translated from American to Indian by Ahmedabad, and it took us a year to convert inches to centimeters. Because we have to find the nearest screws, right? And so, actually it happens in many observatories. We have two sets of spanners, the inch spanners and the centimeter spanners, and two levels of screws. So, even when we get the technology from the Americans, it's very difficult to get, you know, say that we've done it. We have to convert everything because we have to buy, we have to source these things in India. Okay, okay, let's, let us walk. So I've been holding on to this question since the last talk. Oh my goodness. <laughs>
I am not responsible for the last talk. Yes, go ahead. So my question is, uh, I have read somewhere that uh, Earth, uh, you know, we have uh, particles that are accelerated at energies that LHC would never be able to produce that hit Earth all the time, right? So uh, is some uh, some kind of a detector feasible, you know, be uh, in this space that can detect such particles or maybe uh, use that energy and actually have make collisions happen in space itself? You're yeah, very, very good question. Of course, such things happen because I just told you that most of the universe is dark. They don't produce um, light. And this is known as dark matter. The main constituent of the universe is dark matter. And we think, we haven't detected dark matter yet. And we're trying to detect them in the LHC, but we haven't done in the experiments there either. And the chances are, the predictions from various particle physics models is that they're much more massive than the proton and the neutron. The problem is with all these particles that we haven't detected yet, uh, they're chargeless. And just like I'm saying that we see most of the universe through light, and so I need light, we detect most of the particles through the electrical properties. But they're chargeless, they're very, very difficult to detect, right? They can, you can only detect them by through their mechanics, the collision with other things. And that's why we set up these huge detectors under mines to see whether neutrinos we can detect, for example, as the neutrinos are also chargeless and they're tiny and they go through, and the fact that there are millions and billions of them going through your body right now, and maybe one will hit one of these things, one of the particles in this uh, reservoir that we have. And that's how we detected neutrinos. For the dark matter particles or the particles you're talking of, the high energy particles, nobody's detected one yet. And so we're trying to design experiments in order so that we have large enough detectors such that such collisions will happen, because we can't find them through their electrical properties. If you look at how we detected the proton and the neutron and the electron for the first time, they were you know, those tracks that you find, they're all bent due to some magnetic field or collision with things and stuff like that. So that's the main problem. And so there are people who are designing cosmic experiments you know, on the scale of the solar system to see whether you can find evidence of trajectories of these particles. But again, I mean, I think you know, your generation will do this. We haven't been able to do it yet. So this is a huge problem, a, a fundamental problem. Maybe you'll come up with an idea of how to detect charge neutral particles. Right? Now that was indeed a superb presentation, Dr. Somak. Thanks very much. I think. Uh, I'm sorry, I <coughs> kept you so so late, but. No, it's fascinating and like Nandu said, uh, you know, like I told Dr. Seema Sharma also, we are all high school students to that extent we know science. You take us from where we are to the cutting edge science and she tried exactly that and the way you started off also was superb. I think these are some of the subjects that we, uh, we read in passing but never go into the depth but whatever you could explain, we are pretty well understood. I noted on some of the points which are kind of a gray area, but uh, got a lot of clarifications here. Uh, now, certainly, I think one of the questions to which you answered, what is the purpose of this? I think it's a, there's a never-ending quest for the unknown, quest for knowledge. And uh, truly so, like we found in the LSC and also in astrophysics, the more we get to know, the more we realize that we don't know a lot more. And we need to pursue, you know, possibly in different direction also. Uh, though I think uh, uh, gravitational wave, I think there are still a lot of debates on many things if you uh, plunge into it and read, but extremely interesting as to what this could lead to, like you said, you know. This is in, beyond the electromagnetic spectrum. This is giving a new spectrum for which to explore what is in the universe. So we don't know what all we are going to find. Um, so anyway, um, from my point of view, I see this is a very, very simple explanation you could do to a very complex subject for normally and the way we understand. And the, yeah, I think that's beautifully put. I think some of the points that I noted which are very heartening for me. One, India is already in the big league, as you said, you know, and the subject kind of projects that we are handling certainly makes us very proud that India is, and India is the third country beyond US and Italy to have the LIGO being set up here. 
and uh, and uh, you know the projects that we are spending uh, for which we are contributing those expenditure are going to be happening in india those technologies have to be developed in india and uh, even though the design may be there uh, but to be to be incorporating here now the previous ligos would have been set up few years uh, so you know that's uh, yeah so and we now we are setting up. up 10 years 15 years later so you are not going to be exactly replicating that no there are new science new technology that have come we are going to be incorporate that for which the basic some of the design also has to be done within the country yes. it's not just you know in the automotive business we talk about you know so i was uh, in us i was talking to one of the companies in in automotive because i have been in the automotive field so he said we want to source greatly from india now but what are the products that you could give us uh, which is having its own technology which are proprietary items there are not many actually in automotive you know so your automotive friends will know see most of the jobs that we do here is based on the overseas design yeah. and we manufacture here but truly proprietary r&d work that we have done which we call as our ipr we have designed it that could be used in automotive we don't find so many actually but if i look at the isro the kind of success they have had and all the science project that we have done in these are the areas where much of the science and technology for india is actually developing you know so in these areas we are really ahead of most of the other industries in which we are participating within the country anyway uh, some of the other things that uh, clarified was you know you beautifully narrated the impact of einstein theory on gravity certainly is different but what are the implications of that in other understandings of the universe and certainly better understanding of the black hole and the i mean fascinating about the 30 meter telescope it's not 30 meter it is so many of about 1 meter telescope and i read about this 30 meter telescope is that uh, the whole curvature you know once they are fully aligned the kind of uh, variation that you are going to have or you know uh, the total tolerance variation is going to be so much of a nanometer has you know on the, such a, has to be comparable to the to wavelength of light it's it's doing yeah so that's you know, going to be 100 nanometers or so nanometers. so many of them need to be aligned to that is absolutely i mean it's a miraculous thing uh, india's contribution to ligo and the though we have the contribution the challenges in going to be in uh, executing this project uh, i mean uh, we are uh, very proud of uh, what ayuka and the rest of the astrophysicists in the country are trying to achieve uh, for the country i'm going to bring a lot of laurels for the country and is going to of course lead to more technologies iprs within the country and uh, that's fascinating thank you dr somak thank you for a really fascinating talk today and and being an extremely busy man i know his schedule i mean we had to vary and for him to come to hinjewadi today evening to spend with us i am very grateful to you doctor uh, we will have the next uh, equally interesting talk on 18 january that is an energy system and that will be by uh, uh, yeah dr ogle yeah see you then